Simon is the is the Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Lent Term Garrett Seminar uh, series on rethinking past globalization. It's really exciting to uh, be introducing this series to a full house uh, here at the McDonald Institute. Uh, this is the flagship seminar series of uh, the department, the Garrett Seminars, uh, and they attract uh, a range of interesting and exciting uh, scholars. Uh, one of whom is here tonight with us, and uh, and others will join us uh, throughout the series. The series will affected, be affected by the strikes, uh, and next week we'll still be here in person as normal, and we will update the website, and um, so stay tuned to that uh, moving forward in the face of the strikes. Um, Another thing to, to note is that these uh, speakers are very sensitive. So if you're having private conversations or anything, uh, they will be picked up <laughs> for posterity. So, uh, so just uh, be aware of that. Uh, and uh, I just wanna start with a few words on the series theme itself. Uh, so globalization it as most of you probably know, is one of those words that we encounter uh, in daily parlance. And yet, when you think about it, it's not so clear what it actually means. In fact, even scholars whose job it is to figure out what it actually means and characterize and explain globalization can't quite agree on how to define it. In daily use, globalization is found in diverse contexts, from sports to music to politics and the economy. It seems to have something to do with profound and ongoing changes sweeping wide geographic regions and involving greater human connectivity, interdependence, and feelings of time-space compression. But if globalization is to be characterized and explained, it should be possible to determine when and how it began. In fact, this is the topic of an ongoing debate in global studies, and scholars can't quite agree if globalization began something like 30 years ago 150 years ago, 500 years ago, 5,000, 10,000, or even hundreds of thousands of years ago. This is where archaeology comes in, which is supposed to have an advantage when it comes to thinking about human experience at these timescales. Meanwhile, globalization potentially offers a valuable and timely conceptual framework for relating archaeological research to the present. Hence, the purpose of this Garrett seminar series on rethinking past globalization is to genuinely interrogate and problematize the concept of globalization as applied to the archeological and historical past. Our driving question is to what extent and in what ways can we formulate criteria for identifying past globalization or globalizing forces and trends with the ultimate goals of one, making the present relevant in study of the past and two, contributing archeological perspectives to the question of globalization beginnings. World-class researchers in archeology, span history, and sociology will offer their approaches to thinking about these questions. The first of these will begin in just a minute with Justin Jennings on globalization and war state making. Uh, Dr. Jennings is senior cura curator of the Archeology span of the Americas at the Royal Ontario Museum and associate professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto. His research interests include early cities, states, and cultural horizons in the Andes and other regions of the world. Of the world. Uh, Dr. Jennings is the author or editor of 14 books, among them Globalization and the Ancient World, Killing Urbanism, a reassessment of early urbanism and its consequences, and a forthcoming book on improving global governance, learning from long ignored societies. We asked Justin to open the session, uh, not only as a pioneering scholar of globalization in archaeology, uh, one of the first to really apply uh, globalization theory to, uh, to archaeology, but as one who's made the case for it through nuanced arguments that combine a straightforward theoretical approach with archaeological case studies. Over the next hour, we'll hear what Wari expansion in Peru some uh, 1,500 to 1,000 years ago can teach us about globalizing forces in early state making, and maybe even our world today. And maybe we'll even hear a little bit about uh, Justin's personal journey with uh, globalization uh, theory and its relationship to archaeology. So 
without further ado, happy to call up Justin to the, to the podium. Right, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thank you to both Daniel and Carmen for this kind uh, you know, introduction. Thank you all of you for spending an afternoon here. It's a great pleasure to fly uh, here from Toronto and, and do an in-person um, um, event. And so what I'm going to do today is really talk a little bit about my, in some sense, my personal journey looking about looking at globalization over the past um, uh, two decades and what that means in terms of thinking about things like what, what are states and what are cultures uh, and the ways in which archaeologists look at them. And, you know, I suspect um, that, you know, that I was invited to, to sort of speak and, and open the series because of, you know, uh, this book, which was a book that I wrote in 2009, something like that, um, Globalizations in the Ancient World. And so th this was part of my sort of engagement with globalization. And, you know, as Daniel was sort of talking about is that, that oftentimes what, what scholars have done is they look at you know time, look at interaction, and they've wanted to sort of put a line somewhere in this chart and saying, hey, that after that say 1500, that's when globalization globalization starts, or it starts 50 years ago with this uh, you know increase of immigration, for example, post World War II. And you know what I tried to do was challenge some of those notions about trying to sort of think about globalization as a as, as strictly a contemporary phenomenon. And then looking at a wide variety of contexts around the world. Um, and, you know, so looking at, for example, interaction in Great Zimbabwe, you know, that's going to be one of the topics that's going to happen earlier. Can we think about that in terms of the globalization, globalization framework? So that then if we think about globalization as more of a long term process, um, the notion was can we then begin to identify certain key moments in certain places around the world where you have intense interactions? That are, that are thought of perhaps as being globalizing areas or globalizing, right? And so from there, what I what I did in that in that book was try to adapt some of the work being done by uh, largely by social anthropologists, sociologists that were looking at uh, how to define globalization. If it's not about uh, the number of import, if it's not about um, the amount of people going to a place, maybe it's about culture change. And so in that, in that book, I talk a lot about this idea of, of uh, Tom Wilson talked about complex connectivity, right? Um, the ever uh, uh, the developing and, and ever densening a uh, network of, of, of interconnections and interdependencies. And so for, for him, the idea was that this is what globalization is. That it's a cultural phenomenon. And um, I want, I'm not gonna go, go through these in, in length here, but in that book, what it is identified certain aspects of change you see in globalization. So that for globalization scholars, this is what they would see. So they see, for example, that the juxtaposition of the homogenization, right? Greater and greater, you find McDonald's everywhere. But at the same time, you have greater cultural heterogeneity as people begin to, to try to differentiate, differentiate themselves from other people in these eras. So um, time-space compression you talked about, deterioration. Um, and so for these cultural scholars, basically their argument was, that, that globalization is a cultural phenomenon. And then I basically said, this, this book, if you, if, you, if you ever read this book, it's not addressed to archeologists. It's addressed to, to sociologists, political scientists, all these people that don't read the book, right? They often write books that are the, the people that don't read it, right? So in this case, I'm writing this saying, hey, you give me this definition. And then I look at past societies, uh, in this case, three, Wari, Cahokia, and, and Iraq, and was basically saying, hey, let me use those same cultural criteria and see if these then meet those same thresholds for globalization, okay? So it was really just, uh, that book is really just about saying, hey, um, we can use this concept and we can use some of the tools that people have been using to think about globalization, to think about some of these past phenomena, okay? So trying to make this already a fairly dated image here like that, uh, of that computer, for example, but trying to make connections between say the internet and um and donkey caravans moving through throughout mesopotamia devil rim jars and 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 uh commensality so you be so trying to sort of find ways of looking at different cultural connections and the ways those connections were made and the and the consequences of what was happening so that was that that book and that was some of the work that i was doing 
really in the, I guess the early, early aughts, trying to get my head around, trying to understand these cultural phenomena. What, what did they mean? At the same time, um, I was um, working a little bit in trying to understand sort of the ways in which we were thinking about the cross-cultural interactions uh, in the, once again, the early aughts and, and some of the issues that I had with that. So this is just, and I'm not you know, going to go and give you, you know, all the different different articles here, but this is, and this is where it's good to be in the front. You can actually see some of the things here, but these were just different. What I started doing uh, in that period was just started trying to actually visualize what does it mean when we talk about direct control or, or trade-offs or a perceived good model? You know, a lot of these different models that we have, when you actually then begin to go ahead and, um, and put them down uh, on paper, what I was struck by is how often they looked fairly much the same, right? They're almost like different kinds of snowflakes, but they have the same uh, basic geography that I was calling this radial model or periphery systems. And so what I was also struggling, at the same time I'm saying, hey, look, is, is this globalization uh, theory useful? Also was looking at it some, of, some of the ways in which archaeologists were, were trying to conceptualize past uh, systems of long distance interaction. And I uh, was raising some concerns um, uh, during this period. So talking about um, assumptions about, for example, certain structural links, um, uh, ideas about core and periphery that could be fairly static, um, struggling with ideas about hegemony and what hegemony meant. Okay, um, the notion oftentimes you have in those systems that what's happening in this area would be similar to this area because it's an indirect system, whatever it might be. So struggling with trying to find them, combining um, those interests, um, what I what I began to try to do was develop these global culture models, okay, and trying to understand um, how these um, how these larger global cultures form and their relationship to the states and other kinds of political entities. Um, so you had you know trying to develop expansion phases, cascading interactions. Um, localization, cultural organizations. So trying to put these ideas together and then I was applying them, um, in my case, uh, to Wari. So uh, uh, Wari is 600 to 1000 AD. Um, so it's about 500 years or so before the Incas that people are perhaps a little bit more familiar with. Um, and it is sometimes thought of as the first empire in the Andes, and what was and and really Wari scholarship was one of the first folks really pushing on some of these more more uh, hegemonic indirect models of imperialism. So Wari was really in the early nineties, um, you know, facilitating this work. And what I what I was trying to do at that time, about ten or fifteen years ago, um, was trying to sort of get wrap my head around if it's not if we don't want to talk about it as an as Wari as an empire, then what is it, right? And then is it a global culture? We began to sort of create these, I was talking about psychedelics yesterday, I'll talk a little bit about more, but this feels sort of a psychedelic <laughs> sort of image and circle of things moving in different directions. Okay, so it began to try to complicate the picture, but then realizing it oftentimes didn't have the tools and I had a lot of assumptions that I was dealing with. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those assumptions now and some of the issues. And that's indeed, um, I've just sort of taken three, um, three volumes um, um, you know, that have been sort of instrumental in some of these conversations in different parts of the world. But over the last 10 or 12 years, what's happened, there's been a lot of, lot more conversation about globalization. Like, what does it mean? Um, how, is it, how is it working in different kinds of contexts? So a lot of great work, for example, on, on the Silk Road. Um, and what this work has done is began to really begin to complicate the picture, right? All those assumptions that have been had in play all of the discussions um, that, that were had in sort of almost globalization one, which was, oh, wow, we have globalization that's, you know, in the past, but now, okay, how does it work? How is it different in different regions? How is it different than most of what's happening today? A lot of those conversations were only beginning um, to be had. And so, um, you know, once again, very psychedelic. And I just put this picture up here because it represents the, the almost, um, you know, Oh my goodness! Moment we're in right now because we're realizing that things are very, very complicated. That these networks are very dynamic. That there's lots of change in space over time. There's lots of of, of uh, different issues in terms of perspective of different people involved in these networks. And 
And so a great challenge of late has been trying to begin to reconstruct, okay, what are these, um, what, what does a globalizing era look like? What are its implications in the ways in which we look at things? And so some of the issues that I, that, you know, that we're wrestling with still, um, and this is, I mean, this is, of course, uh, this is my way of trying to get at sort of the, the standard, you know, models of, of sociocultural evolution, right? The bands, tribes, chiefdom, states, models, where um, the one thing that, that, that you're noticing time and time again, even though we know that societies don't evolve like staircases, that when we talk about things, you realize that we are oftentimes still in the back of our heads organizing, you know, these things. The Maya were there, then, there, then it's post-classic, then it's this, then it's that. They're kind of all the same for this entire period, and then boom, you know, you have, an, you have a, another revolution, right? So one of the challenges that I've been facing with is to try to try to try to keep on pushing this this these models to the to the front. And this was you mentioned the killing civilization. That was you know, that's a weird book because I, I decided that civilization was like this golem that we kept on trying to kill and we could never kill it. And that was my way to write a book because I was got excited about you know killing things or whatever. So killing this notion that just wouldn't die. And that's what trying to do is making sure we continue to, to be front and center about, okay, what does it mean when I say Maya or Bori or Olmec, uh, if we're talking about the world, what does that mean in terms of, of um, in terms of my models? So there's a reification of these cultural concepts that we have to continually fight against and assumptions about what those cultures were. Um, the other aspect here, uh, and, and you, know, you certainly don't need to, need to read this big blurb, but you know, of course, what often happens in, in archaeology, at least at least for me, is I'm routinely humbled as I do some research and 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 for example, in this case, political science, and realizing that people in political science have been wrestling with issues of the state and what, what states are for, for decades, and then realize, okay, yeah, you know, let me get involved in this. Um, and and I'll just emphasize this one part here in reader, which is you know, we're only making difficulties for ourselves and supposing that we have. We have also to study the state, an entity, agent, functional relation over and above the state system and the state idea. Okay. And the other issue that we're getting at right now and, and working at is that not only you, are you reifying this sort of stepwise development, but oftentimes we keep on trying to find something out there that's a chiefdom, that's a state, that, that goes that's above and beyond the people and interactions that are happening, right? There's a sense that that yes, you know, there's a mayor and they're working for this, for this city and that city is somehow out there and, and 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 living an entity that is not made and constituted through those interactions if we begin to think about that more as an idea and a relationship it once again transforms the ways we, we look at states and they transform the way that we look at the globalization process right? and, and and as i go on what i'll be doing is it's kind of intermingling the idea of state and statehood and statecraft and globalization because these things are are very much intertwined, and I'll talk about that, you know, as I go along. Um, the other, the, the other aspect here, once again, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get too Deleuzian here and, and assemblages, um, but um, that the so the other the influence has also been coming in terms of of my thinking, and other people's thinking is 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 beginning to look at at uh, different ways of thinking about. Um, Instead of looking at, at, at uh, stage development, for example, thinking about these ongoing assemblages that change radically over space and time, um, you know, ontological heterogeneity, right? This is, I mean, like I said, Thousand Plateaus, awful book. Uh, you know, some people may be, you know, huge illusions here. But what it does do is really sort of pushes you to, to remember, right, that, that these, um, that, that, these institutions are always in a state of becoming, right? They're always being created through, through relationships. Or oftentimes they're being created through relationships on a small scale, especially in these societies we don't have, have writing. Uh, you don't have um, you know, systems of story knowledge in the same way. So to remember that this ongoing process and that because of that, you have to kind of think about globalization and you have to think about, okay, how are ideas transferred and they're transferred through this constant creation of an assembly of bringing objects, animals, people, ideas together in particular places. And I'll give you a little bit more concrete examples as I, as I uh, talk a little bit about trying to understand more. 
Okay. And finally, I figured I'd, you know, bring in, um, you know, some, some, some Cambridge folks in terms of, you know, John, John Bob's work, because I've, I've, um, you know, gotten a little bit excited. He, he talks a little bit about, about projects, right? Thinking about um, agency through the idea of, of projects. And it basically is what it is, is that people decide to have a project and they try to create assemblages that make those, that those projects go here and, uh, and move forward. And so if we think of globalization and state making, we can think of it in terms of projects and ancillary effects of those projects. Okay, because oftentimes with globalization, what we're finding is that um, there are unintended consequences of activities that are trying to build institutions elsewhere, right? The globalization is almost spillover effects of, of, of other actions. We'll get into that a little bit. So, um, you know, more or less then, because one of the issues that you're seeing is interesting as you have these conversations with other scholars, is that you realize that, that you're trying to understand a very uh, complex, um, rapidly changing uh, system. And the question is, what are the ways in which you're going to study that? And so what I'm going to talk a little bit is some of the ways that I've been trying to, to understand, in this case, um, what, um, you know, what is war. So, and, and I'm going to do that, and I'll tell you sort of three ways to do it. I'm not going to come up with a, def, a, a sort of a clear idea necessarily of what is war. I'm going to give you some sense of the ways in which we can look at some of those complexities, look at some of those aspects of those networks and how it relates to globalization. Um, and one of the ways is, is through looking at um, looking at agents. Something I talked to a few people here that, would, that were on, um, I gave a little bit of lecture on this yesterday, but you can see these different individuals right here um, that oftentimes a lot of, a lot of um, worry I can argue, especially early on, you have figures that are oftentimes in conflict and alliances, and they have particular features, and I'll show those features in just a second. But you see those same agents found across the entire entire empire, um, or entire empires that mm -hmm. when you put the sort of entire phenomenon, you've got these different individuals that are placed that are located there. And so work has been done about and then you've given these these individuals agents. You'll see, for example, Agent 103 is a very um, uh, a very widespread agent, right? and they're and they're found in these uh, variety. They're found on textiles. They're found on pottery. They're found in metalwork. And what uh, what I've done with some colleagues is we're doing some social network analysis. So then, what what you begin to do is you see, look at the spread of these of these agents, and then you start doing you know alliances. Is Agent One Hundred Four associated with Agent One Fifty Four, for example? Uh, you begin then to look at some of the politics, look at some of the regionalization. So one of the ways in which you can 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 uh, can begin to think of of um, these these eras is try to try to coordinate some of the political relationships and what those mean and how those are shifting and changing over time. Um, and then different sites um, are associated with different agents and different agents doing different things. So, for example, here's a, here's an agent found in the site that we excavated on. It's great here. You see, he's got a, a rope around his uh, his neck. His, his uh, um, arms are bound. This is showing a, a captive. So it's showing a captive, and um, we have other 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 uh, pottery elsewhere that shows who this person was captured by. Okay. So these are stories that are being told and retold over generations that talk about about people's relationships. And in places like where I work in, in this site called Tukapamba, what you see is you see that certain groups are associated with certain agents, right? And they're telling certain stories about that agent and their relationship with others, right? So you have these narratives that are very important in the individuals. When you talk about worry in those colonies, those individuals are associated, yes, with some sort of war, broad worry culture phenomenon, but they're very much associated with named ancestors and their stories, right? And that's what their connection is, okay? Um, and so when you think about Ori as a cultural phenomenon, it's interesting then because you do have things here like the staff DNA that you those, you also see this, this figure at Tiwanaku for those folks that are aware of, of that era. But so there are some sort of notions to break the centralized uh, idea and centralized religion. But so much about worry is about those relationships between individuals. And then, then the relationship of those groups that are creating a sense of community through the relationship to those ancestors. 
right? So understanding the middle horizon, my point is, is understanding those agents and those relationships and how they change over time. You want to understand that network, uh, you do that. Now it gets even, you know, it gets more complicated though as well, because then you also have a lot of emulation. So that worry, so these that these worry staff, uh, so these worry agents are depicted in a lot of worry sites that are um, you know, you know, colonies of the um, you know, of of the uh, you know, from from the sort of state center in, in Ancucho. But at the same time, people adapt this. And so then you have a sense of, okay, these aren't worry agents per se, but people are using the same notion of building ancestors, building community, talking about relationships between people, right? It's creating a shared idiom in which people that are not associated with the state are interacting and talking about themselves and talking about their relationship with the state. Okay, so it creates a way in which people communicate with each other. And it's that spillover effect, right, that's happening. That's creating more and more networks and determining how people are interacting with each other through the use of ancestors. Okay, at the same time, you're seeing another aspect here, talk about sort of community building, some of these projects. Um, and here's an example. This is uh, a rendition of, of, uh, of a feast that was occurring in one of the sites called Hickey. Um, but it's important when you look at uh, some of the worried, worried centers uh, that are in the highlands of Peru, um, there's no big plazas in, 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 in worry sites. Instead, the feasting occurs in fairly small locations like these interior patios and D-shaped pebbles. And you'll see that redundant across the entire, entire site. Each one of these are associated with a group of ancestors. <laughs> those ancestors are often emulated in those ages that I talked about. And so you are inviting people from the community um, into these spaces. And if you look at uh, both the paleobotanical and the, and, the, and the faunal data, what you see is that these are not only feasts where you're going ahead and being invited, but they're feasts that you're preparing, okay? So that people in the community are, they're preparing the meat, they're preparing, preparing the beer, they're preparing, uh, they're preparing all the food that is then consumed. Okay, so it's more like a potluck, but that's interesting from a, from a community perspective then, because you're all involved in that preparation, right? Is that you're creating, that community, that shared ancestry, right? So you are coming through. You're 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 the one that's uh, that's supporting um, this work. And then when you look at at those spaces, they're oftentimes uh, fairly dirty. In that um, people make concentrated efforts to show the pile of spent uh, moye troops that were used to make the beer. They want to pile the bones. They want to make very clear that this effort was made. Okay, so not only are you you, you are you all preparing the feast that, uh, preparing the stuff for the feast that you will you will then celebrate at the end we're breaking those vessels and we are also very much showcasing all the labor and work that went into it okay so if you think about worry then it the worry the idea of worry is that idea of community being being built through the shared feasting and the shared ancestor worship that's occurring here and you see that here for example in this Asian cup, um, where, where once again, you are just imagine you're at this event having glass of beer after glass of beer after glass of beer. And that glass is the shape of an ancestor that has a unique story that's being told, right? And so in these, in these other communities here, where it might be outside, where you don't see yourself as being worried, what you do get though then is you're beginning to create those connections through the shared feasting, the shared rituals, the shared stories, the shared memories. And oftentimes what you do see is, is not only people shattering pots, but keeping pieces of pots. Um, we have evidence, for example, that, that a pot will be shattered and 20 years later, they'll bring part of the pot back and put it in the same location. Um, and then on top of that, not only, not only are you having the feast and having a, uh, you know, a good time, but you, they, they, there's evidence now for these beverages combining, this is the moye, which is a, a California pepper tree, is what it's sometimes called in the Americas. Um, but uh, you combine that with uh, anathenical labrina, which is a powerful psychedelic. So they're not only having uh, beer after beer after beer, but you're having this fairly powerful psychedelic beer, this special beer. Okay. So we are not only drunk, we're high, 
We're telling these beautiful stories about ancestors. We're pulling out our mummies. We're doing all sorts of stuff and creating this community. Okay, but the point, what I'm trying to make, if you're thinking about war, here's a here's a wonderful picture of uh, of this sort of central god, and these are all this these and then there are uh, pods that are all around it. If you're thinking about what 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 war is, war is not this sort of state that's out there or empire that's out there. War, for all intents and purposes, is this reoccurring feasting event where you're creating those community connections over and over again. Okay, so these are central nodes that are creating this sort of globalizing effort, but it's happening very much at this local scale. But then flip it again as well, because um, when you talk about war, you talk about these D-shaped enclosures and these rectangular co compounds that are the site of, of feasts. We then see, not only do we see for example, those agent ideas of agents and ideas of ancestors getting pushed outward. Local local groups are then also taking these same feasting regimes and using it for their own devices as well, right? So once again, you're globalizing these practices that have nothing to do necessarily with relationships, colonial relationships, but are a way of creating larger collective groups. And so people then during that era are beginning to use those tools in order to create, to create ideas. Okay, so you're globalizing some of those practices and some of those notions. Um, okay, and finally, uh, talking about um, sort of mesoscale assemblages. So, so once again, uh, what I'm trying to do here is just give you some sense of at least for us is how do we attack um, sort of this globalization issue? How are the ways in which we begin to sort of uh, complicate the picture, if you will, of these eras? And one way is to look at it, look for us at the mesoscale, begin to really try to understand. Um, where are the areas of, of direct colonization? Where are the areas of influence? Um, what does influence moving mean in these different different cases? You know, what what parts of the assemblages um, are being copied, which ones aren't? We begin to, to reconstruct those pictures in places like, uh, for example, this area and 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 uh, southern Peru. Um, and then looking at uh, so looking at things, for example, here's a site called a Pateraya, and then looking at the ways in which um, different um, groups are taking that grammar, if you will, that that worry grammar about how to organize and how to or, how to do feast, and and changing it over time in different places in order to to, to fit to local needs. So you begin to construct that, and just imagine on the meso scale, you're doing that not just in one location, but are 10, 12, 15, beginning to see how these how these uh, networks um, are interacting. Do the same thing with some of the pottery um, here, which is, you know, because there's wonderful in this era, for example, they are taking um, not only uh, worry motifs and making their own spin on it, but they're taking ceramics from very different locations, bringing imports. Uh, you know, there's a great, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a great uh, fringe, yeah. the fringe uh, tunic that I always wanted to get because it was, there's fox fur on the sides. It had human hair, and it would take parts of tunics and would would cut them up and reassemble them. Right. So these these incredible pastiches that are occurring at, during this period, but these pastiches that are trying to bring in lots of elements, ideas of of, of foreign influence, of uh, ideas about um, hierarchy that are new, and they're trying to, to fit it to the local local conditions. So once again, taking these notions, but then. And then trying to look across a, a larger scale of how these parts begin to, to interact. Um, doing the same thing, we're doing the same thing in that region in terms of, of ancient roadways. The great thing in the in the Andes is that um, is that the areas are so dry, we can actually trace the trace the pre-Hispanic roadways. We can actually see how sites were connected. And so we can begin to do that. So you can see right now, like I said, I'm not gonna bore you, but I can afterwards if uh, but but you can see what we're trying to do, right? Is now we have the, the networks, we have the nodes, we have the assemblages, we have the architecture, and you begin to build this, this, and then you then and then what we'll do, which is real, yeah. You can't even see that there, but that's my point. Then you get all the dates, right? And then you begin to do your basic analysis and then try to break things down more and more until you're beginning to get the, you know, this notion, you know, and then you fold it. Um, you know, then you fold it uh, into uh, discussions of those social agents right? uh, and those networks. So you take that mesoscale material record, fold it in with uh, things like the agents, 
uh, look at some some you know great detailed uh, iconography analysis, say from our historical perspective. So that's what I think that that we're beginning to see in terms of globalization studies more and more as people trying to get these these sort of layered approaches to try to get at some of those really dense networks and how they change. If you actually begin, you know, the the the, the notion here is that is that you know assemblages, you know, assemblages theory. Everyone likes to talk about that right now, uh, at least in the Andes. It's a sexy topic. It's really really hard, right? Because if you're you're demanding lots and lots of change. Okay, so so I mean, more or less, then is that, that that's that's you know um, what I see see us us doing as we move forward is trying to sort of un, you know um, work with those uh, elements, and then from that as well is really looking at in terms of um, um, of taking globalization and state making. And trying to see them not as separate entities or or residual ent ent entities, but indeed as one and the same, right? So that you know, I'm still going to argue like I did all. It doesn't sound that like, but all the way back in 2009, I guess for some people that does sound like a long time. But you know, I'll still say you know, I still want to talk about complex connectivity. I think that's a good definition, a good beginning point. Um, with with that, but but when I what I'm trying to do, and it's it's that I, I have tended, in, uh, you know, to think of globalization and, and colonization and global expansion as sort of independent entities, but that's not really a very useful way of doing things. We have to begin to inter, in, in, interdigitate some of those notions uh, and think about it in terms of something like a symbol to creation. Um, you know, thinking about the state, uh, you know, in different ways, as an idea and suite of, uh, uh, and, and also suite of often conflicting concepts. Which is what we often see in Mori, and I would argue many other states in both the New and Old World, is that is that you know the, the early state especially is a mess, right? There's lots and lots of different agents that oftentimes are working across purposes, right? And trying to get at some of those nuances, I think, is very important because it has implications for how we think of the globalization concept. Um, you know, and then and then finally talking about sort of the state of centralized or organized structure is neither necessary for expansion or inequity. And this is interesting. You know, for me, in terms of in terms of of um, of Mori and some other examples that we could speak of, is that oftentimes the push towards centralization is a later push that actually kills those those initial um, uh, colonies because they're not built like that, and it's actually a later push. A lot of times, you talk about the state and state formation. I would say that actually oftentimes occurs several several centuries after initial globalization. Um, I think that's it. I'm looking at this last. Oh yeah, just thank you. Just about, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Justin, for the very, very exciting talk. So do you have any questions for Justin? Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I guess to get the ball okay. rolling, um, and kind of taking that last um, set of I don't know conclusions as a jumping off point as well. Um, I'm really curious about the use of the word state and empire, mm -hmm. and are you seeing those as you know distinct constructs? Is there something that separates the state from an empire in the way that you're thinking about it? Um, and you presented these sort of radial for peripheries, you know, I get that we're talking about networks that are like much more complex than that. And I, I really appreciate it. I think the kind of foliage like graphics, um, but you know, okay. So if we're moving away from center periphery, but you're still talking about central periphery, you know, when you were talking about the Mori, for example. So I'm just kind of curious to hear a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So you, you, you have uh, given us three massive topics. Sorry. <laughs> So we'll see. I mean, certainly the the um, I mean the delineation between state and empire is you know two aspects for me. One is the delineation between state and empire is is sort of broad and eyes of the border. And then two is that is that you know what is a state is is also fairly you know fairly fraught you know topic. I mean, I I just you know um, oftentimes people talk about so for example, Bruce Trigg would talk about the switch from from in class based science, right? saying that states are class based science. Um, 
what I've seen is that often, at least in the earliest states, that that's just wrong. So the class remains, but what you're doing is trying to reconfigure the class. And so if you're thinking about these these expanding political polities, and I would talk about, um, you know, a lot of them, the old world, the rook, um, et cetera, et cetera, all of them are, are different. Oftentimes they're not states in the, in the entity that we would sort of think about as sort of hierarchically organized, let's say a king, whatever, that's organizing these things. They're often very much, you know, ad hoc processes that are that are spillovers of other activities. Like the, the rook, it's, it's has to do with you know, temple economies and the, and the creation of temple economies and how they're reacting, you know, to um, to broader, broader aspects. So it is something that we're, you know, for me, that the notion is is instead of thinking about states, and this is a little bit maybe a, a dodge, but think about about particular institutions and those particular institutions and with which they interact with each other and, and how those institutions expand. Right. And so in case of worry, for example, what you often see is you see institutions that are built, they're built to work in, you know, with 200 people, and then they're trying to be expanded to work for 200,000, right? And so you can see a lot of a lot of difficulties, and oftentimes with worry or with Inca later periods, that you see that these that 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 the state or however you want to talk about it is not it's not this big, broad, expansive sort of control. It's actually happening in these in these 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 little assemblies, these little moments, right? And then those little moments are sort of different over time. Now, in terms of core periphery, the notion here, which is interesting, is that, yeah, it's hard to get away from that. You talk about, you don't want to do it, then you find yourself, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm reiterating, you know, some of those same concepts. Um, what, what, what's, um, so, but for example, here, and, and Kyokopamba, I'm just pointing out some section of Kyokopamba, but, but the work that we just did, looks like it is a, it is a diaspora colony that is occurring after political changes in war and people are leaving. Think of like pilgrims coming to the to the to the, to the colonies. And so in this case, it is, there's a core periphery element to it, but then they're not answering to the core in the same way. They're actually they're actually creating their own core. And what's happening routinely in these places, you have to think about they're creating their own mini core, right? They're creating new relationships. The, these war colonists come and what are they trying to do? They're trying to establish relationships, local relationships, because they don't have, no, this is not a military conquest sort of scenario. I have to continue to make these make these reasons for why you should believe in us. And a lot of that then is the feasting regimes, et cetera, right? So I think there are going to be core and periphery elements, but then once again, and there's certainly dominance issues, et cetera, but you have to think about that in those layers and different ways as you move forward. Sure. You might have come out question what you were saying in the very um, let's come back to the previous slide, the conclusion. Don't worry, it's not. Uh, um, I think the second to last point was something about sort of com competing or conflicting projects versus, oh, sure, sure. versus yeah. the yeah. Kind of the big idea or something. Yeah. Like yeah. How you phrased yeah. it. Yeah. I just said but yeah. more in the, about, about these conflicting projects, sure. how we see them archaeologically. Sure. sure. So so my, think, my head is also in other states, yeah. in, in other globalizations that you were talking about. Right, again. right. I mean, it, 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 where is your end? Where are the other? Other? Well, I was thinking, I mean, I was at any kind of extra thinking about the Roman world. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and Mesopotamia. Sure. Mesopotamia. sure. And you're about conflicting projects. Sure. I think, you know, so in part, um, you know, so let me, I'll, I'll give you the worry notion of that and then, then maybe expand it in some other places. But, you know, once again, when you look at that, when you look at the, the you know, the quote unquote worry capital, right, the core, uh, what you'll see is that, is that once again, there's no palace, there's no central palace, there's no great plaza, there's no great temple. Instead, it's divided into um, a lot of these D-shaped, you know, dozens of D-shaped temples that are oftentimes being built one after the other in different locations. And these um, these elite households with their plazas, that, and, and what you see is over time is that they're they're working for followers, right? And so what's happening there, especially in the beginning of the Middle Horizon period, is that there is nothing, there is no sort of you know uh, uh, upper echelon that's organizing things. It's all a competition between these small groups vying for vying for followers, right? And it's very what you'll see. Yeah. The first part of that phrase you had in that wasn't it? That was kind of a big idea or something. I'm like, oh, what did I say? And the globalization is the connectivity. Yeah, that one or the other one, globalization and colonization or something. Is it that one? I almost read it. 
Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, that yeah. birth an idea, that's right. Oh, yeah. Sweet yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so and so basically what happens then is that is that what 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 I what I tended to see is that um I mean there's a broader argument in in in, in the art you know urban archaeology of archaeology cities, which is basically, you know, can you have a city with not a state, right? And what I've argued um over the past few years is that is that based on the evidence I see is that is that um, the state, no matter how you define it, comes after urbanization. It's, the state is a is a is a is a solution. To the problem of having so many people, and oftentimes the 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 initial um, ways in which you organize uh, urban life is very much segmented based on some of these existing practices. Basically, you are just um, you know I, I go back to uh, you know Ian Hodder talked about Chateauvieux. He says it's a very very large village, and what he means by that is that. They are act, you know, they're actively ignoring everyone else and trying just to sort of keep it, keep it going right there. And that's the same thing that happens with Bori. A lot of, uh, you know, some of the, um, you see the same thing with things like Angry Rock, for example, is that lots of sort of parallel, I call it almost parallel play, lots of redundancy, Teotihuacan, lots and lots of redundancy in these urban cities, right? Um, and then, um, but at the same time, there are efforts to create an idea of something bigger. And so that's what I'm getting at with sort of the state as an idea. The state is something, okay, yeah, you know, we're Cahokia, you know, we're this, we're that, trying to create a larger notion. And so oftentimes what you see, at least I see in, in more in other places, is this, this conflict between the notion of something bigger, but the day-to-day -day activities are really vested at a much lower level, right? And the allegiances are a much lower level. And oftentimes what happens, what I'm saying is that when when so so for Rory, for example, is that there's all this where it talked about all this sort of you know elite households sort of battling with each other, sort of a, almost a house society model. Um, around 850 or so, what happens is is someone gets in control and raises all those structures and begins to build a city based on it, based on a based on a you know a logic, you know, let's say you know, Rome life. When Rome is great because Rome's also the same thing, right? All these villages and something and they're trying to make something big of it, right? But in the case of Wari, what happens? They do this. They do this work, and guess and, and guess what? They, they never complete it. The city goes goes to pot because they can't actually. Uh, they can't push that idea. They cannot make that transfer. And that's what I see routinely. Some of these earliest cities is they they're unable to create that that hierarchical order the first time around. It happens in subsequent cities, but in the first places like Wari, they're still invested in this in this small thing. But the globalization, then the point is. It's happening at that at that lower level of different entities that are making it. And you see that, for example, Monte Alban, where Monte Alban, they are um, sorry, I'm giving you a lot of new world examples. <laughs> I'm scared about to talk to the old world. I'm talking about new world. I hope you guys are not as well vested. But the but Monte Alban is interesting because it seems that the colonial projects are all um they're they're they they are different communities, different neighborhoods are sponsoring those those projects rather than Monte Alban in general. Is that different communities are cursed up in their relationships? Still, they were kinds of the same way, right? Is that each each group has to sort of organize its own own affairs, um, and so there's that there's that tension. So it's a very long long answer to your to your to your because we finally found the slide. I'll keep the slide there. Uh, we have one kind of technical question uh, sure. from the webinar, and then maybe back to, to this discussion. Uh, Mary Hill Harris asks, "Where does Pot C come from?" <laughs> you can just scroll up with it. It, 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 it. Oh, maybe oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just can't. Yeah. yeah. So this is coming. So, so, but this is a, um, so this is coming from a site called La Real, which is great. It's, uh, it's, um, it's a uh, mortuary. It's a mortuary cave, cave with about 160 individuals that were put there, and then um, they are uh, and there's these. All the, they're destroying these individuals. Lots of interesting stuff. But then they're they're putting uh, all sorts of pots that are that are showing different relationships. This is coming from uh, the central poster group. So it's a different uh, a, a different era. And what we're seeing at the very beginning of the Middle Horizon is as people begin, um, this is not a, a worry colony, but the local people at the very beginning are, are worry is just foreign. 
and and, the, and foreign capital is important. Um, uh, you know, so so the notion of war being important is some of the ideas and some of the, and some of the notions, and then they're getting power from many different places, right? So what's also interesting over time, right, is that the the rationales, the the local rationales, and the use of war changes, and and interestingly, um, war iconography becomes more common in this area after our, our evidence for interregional interaction, long distance interaction declines, right? They get more wary when they have less interactions with the core, right? Um, because now it's a local currency. It has little, that's oftentimes the issue too, that's interesting, right? Oftentimes, uh, you know, um, Roman is nothing necessarily with relationships with Rome. It has relationships with, with hierarchy and status and cuisine and things like that. That's a local conversation. And we have to, you know, work harder in distinguishing some of those from yeah, so thank you. Any further questions? Oh, Matt. Thanks, Justin. That was, it was really thought-provoking. Um, I've been trying to think how I frame this this question. Uh, I think it inter interrelates with many of the things you, you've been saying and the discussion you were just having with, with Graham, but I sort of, I approach questions around globalization from looking at the recent history of East Africa, the last few hundred years or so, and, and quite a strong literature on um, uh, colonial and post-colonial development, etc. And in that literature, there's a really interesting trend from, you know, these phases where globalization is obviously associated with the colonial state and with power relations and uh, uh, intentional acts to try and transform and change culture through the state. And in many ways, there's that lineage of thinking that associates um, globalizations with power and with the state and with empires, et cetera, and it's spread in, in those ways. But then there's, there's this counterpoint of literature, which is very much about, well, actually, globalization is this process that runs beyond the state well in advance. And I think you've been making many of those arguments, right? And in many ways, the state is, is paying catch up to those globalization processes. The obvious example I love from Kenya is Safaricom, which is the telecoms communication system that transformed itself into a bank overnight and caught the state out. And the state had to completely change its entire financial structure and regulations in response to a, a global telecoms company. And my, my question to you, I guess, then is, do we need a change of narrative here, which refocuses away from formal states, colonization and empires, and towards that way in which the state is actually quite a weak actor here. And the daily acts of, in which people are transforming the world are much more powerful. We just, they're harder to pick out in some way, and they're harder to theorize. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, certainly, I think, you know, there, there's there's lots of elements in that in your comments, your questions, but certainly one of them is always, you know, the, the theory that we kind of have as archaeologists in general is that we'll go ahead and say that's a myopic, right? Um, and, and there's so much load into that, you know, conversation and, 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 and what that means. So in the case of something like this, once again, is that, is that these interactions and these uses of these motifs are not at all about the state, what we might define. There's no, at least there's no state infrastructure. There's no, there's no people from that or anything that we want to do. There's just, this is out, out there. But um, there are a set, set of ideas that are quite powerful in this case they're for the first time beginning to really buttress notions of, of, um, of, of hierarchy and of differences in people. And there's a narrative there that becomes very powerful. And then you see changes that are made in some of these motifs. And it's always interesting too, you know, what, what aspects are being taken in, what aspects are being transformed. Uh, there's an interesting, I'm not gonna go into that because we don't really know, but there's, there's a skull head motif in, in, in Warrior Pots. Like if, if you find them in place in Ayacucho, where place like Oregon, and then by the time you get to places like this, it turns into a smiley face, right? What does that mean? We're not sure. This is kind of cool, okay? But, you know, and it's almost as if there's there's a different value there, and they're playing with some of these notions. So, um, you know, I would I would certainly agree, and I'll it, you know, um, I'll just go back here to this. Where is that? You know, this very thing, you know, which is, I think, your sort of point is okay. We have lots of interactions happening, lots of transferring confirmations after these globalizing eras. Sometimes the states um, are able to that, but what we're learning more and more of, and even those states that we think of as, as all popular, make those arguments, 
in Egypt, Mesopotamia, et cetera, we're realizing more and more they're incredibly weak, right? And so what they're doing is they're, they're, they're concentrating just certain narrow aspects of society and trying to control those in certain ways in terms of, for example, um, uh, you know, literally fencing off production of, of, of faience or whatever it might be, you know? And so, so within this, what you're doing is looking at this narrative of globalization and finding you know, so what I do in terms of the, of the stage, looking at those particular actors that are trying to promote an idea and the ways in which they're trying to sort of promote that idea, uh, the way that they're trying to, to promote their power, and then looking at the way that, that they do that on the landscape, and then looking at, once again, those spillover effects and the ways that other people then analyze it, right? Because then suddenly you're doing that, but then some of the, so then they people don't learn how to do fairness. Then they have to do something else in this cat and mouse game, but it's happening within this broader broader landscape. Our problem has been, I think, to your point, is trying to sort of draw a circle around all this stuff and call it a state. And then you're done with it because you put it into your staircase rather than dealing with the mess, by right? dealing with the complexity. And whether you use assemblages or networks, or whatever, a lot of the work now is actually trying to get into those weeds because you can't understand those, those relationships until you begin to really break down space and time and and um, you know material record in ways that you can begin to look at some of those questions. Yeah. Okay, one so, last question before we move on. To okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. I should yeah, I can't remember your yeah. Sorry. But you also have one. Well, I mean, we have to be moving on to do that. Okay. okay. So so my question is uh, are you still committed to the kind of eight criteria that I think you attributed to Tomlinson that you use in your book? Or is globalization really a way of saying complex networks? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an open question. You know, so you have, you know, for example, you know, Andre Gunder from a long time ago, you know, one of his big, um, one of his big contributions was saying, hey, that, that, that globalization is not 500 years old, it's 5,000 years old, right? By the way, the co-editor of that book will be speaking next week. <laughs> All right, I have a nice dinner <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and, but, but that's the, the, the issue, right, is that you go ahead and you say it's all globalization or there are moments of globalization. And, and you know, what I, and I think it's, it's potato potato kind of thing, you know, it's, it's, but, but it's relevant to me in the sense that, that there are certainly moments of time in histories around the world where there's lots of connections and lots of cultural change. Um, sometimes they have to do with political expansion. Sometimes you have to do with religious expansion, but there's moments, and that's where we talked a little bit about um, this tomorrow. Hodes who was also giving you know, a lecture here, um, but you know I did a I did something for a globalization volume that that she edited, and trying to understand okay, how does you know when are those moments and when aren't, when aren't those moments, right? And uh, and so for me, you know, it's difficult. I mean, I don't you know I don't like sitting there doing trait lists and checking out boxes and saying need these eight things. Um, but at the same time, what I'm hoping to do is try to create a space for us to say, okay, um, you know, there there are errors of relative isolation, relative moments where even it's, it's fascinating because you'll see lots and lots of, for example, of Sydney exchange. We know people are interacting back and forth, but they're not changing culturally, right? And what I mean by that is that in terms of material culture, it remains the same. Right. And other moments where things radically change very quickly and trying to understand what are the triggers, you know, for that. And it seems a lot of that ends up oftentimes being with politics and elites and the ways in which people are trying to legitimize, you know, their positions. Right. So I, I think that's a question that we're trying to explore. But for me, I'm trying to sort of sort of figure out those moments of, of increased of, of increased interaction, and cultural change, how they're related. And trying to separate those out from the larger sort of pulse of, of interactions that, that may be occurring over time. Wow. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Justin. So, should we give him a round? Great, great discussion outside.